Good afternoon. The guests for today will arrive shortly. I request you to kindly switch off your cell phones or put them on the silent mode, please. Thank you.
Today, we have with us His Excellency Dr. Faisal Meghdad, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Expatriates of the Syrian Arab Republic. His Excellency has served as the permanent representative of the Syrian Arab Republic to the United Nations from 2003 to 2006. He is also an expert on the nuclear non-proliferation. His Excellency will speak to us on developments in Syria and the region and India-Syria relations. The event is being live streamed on YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, the event will be moderated by Ambassador Sujan R. Chinoy. May I now request a Ambassador Chinoy to deliver the welcome remarks. Thank you, sir. Your Excellency, Dr. Faisal Meghdad. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. It's indeed uh, our honor to host you, Your Excellency, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Expatriates of Syria at our institute today. I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to His Excellency, Dr. Fadi Al-Khalil, uh, head of the Planning Commission of Syria, as well as uh, Ambassador Bassam Al Khatib. I take this opportunity to thank uh, Joint Secretary Wana from MEA, Mr. Pradeep Singh Rajpurohit, for having given us this uh, very excellent idea of uh, hosting you uh, at our institute, and it's indeed a great privilege for us to do so. And I also want to acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, my close uh, colleagues and friends, uh, uh, Admiral Shekhar Sena. Uh, we have uh, General Srivastav. We have General Sharma uh, and my own colleague, of course, uh, the Deputy Director General. I uh, see many distinguished ambassadors in the audience, uh, too numerous uh, for me to name individually, so you'll forgive me if I don't go down that road. I want to reserve uh, whatever time we have for you, Your Excellency, so that you can share your thoughts with us. And so let me begin by saying that for us in India, we have always had this historical fascination for your great country uh, and the land of the Syrian Arab Republic reminds us uh, always of uh, an ancient land with a great uh, civilizational heritage, a rich culture, very similar in many ways to ours. And for that, uh, I can say with confidence that we share many things in common. Um, our uh, outlook is often uh, similar in civilizational terms. And our ties uh, date back to several centuries. Uh, over the years, this relationship has been nurtured through regular uh, high-level visits such as yours. And these visits give a great impetus to bilateral ties. India is one of Syria's key developmental partners. And I dare say that as we emerge as the fastest uh, growing economy in the world, uh, uh, we look to doing more with Syria. Uh, and especially in capacity building uh, projects. In recent years, I think we have proved uh, to be a true friend of uh, uh, the uh, Arab uh, countries and especially uh, Syria in uh, reaching out to you during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we had uh, uh, sent across uh, 2,000 metric tons of uh, food grains like rice, uh, 10 metric tons of medicines, uh, to strengthen Syria's uh, own efforts uh, to meet its food and uh, healthcare security requirements. Over 500 Syrians have benefited from the artificial limbs, uh, what we call the Jaipur foot. Uh, and we've run camps there in India, uh, in Damascus in 2020. And we really hope that uh, this helps uh, those in dire need, those who have suffered the excesses of uh, war and strife. Um, we have extended more than a thousand scholarships. This gives you an idea of uh, a very well-rounded relationship that we have with Syria. And uh, batches of Syrian diplomats have also been coming to India for uh, certain capacity building and training programs since 2018. Um, and we want to be uh, present in your digital transformation as well. Syria's devastation as a result of war is a very painful reminder for the rest of uh, humankind of the need to respect national boundaries and sovereignty. It has uh, also given everyone 
a chance to reflect on the dangers uh, posed by radical ideologies, terrorist groups, um, and they pose a perennial threat to regional peace and security. India hopes to see a, a comprehensive and peaceful resolution of the uh, decade-long Syrian conflict through a Syrian-led, Syrian-owned dialogue involving all parties to the conflict uh, that take into account the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian people, uh, no less, while preserving the unity, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of your nation. Uh, friends, the past few years uh, have witnessed major changes in the global strategic uh, landscape. The effects of the pandemic have been compounded by uh, great power competition, uh, major power rivalry, and this is spilling over into diverse areas from trade to technology, uh, I dare say to ideology as well. Um, the focus of the global community today is on economic recovery in the midst of uh, fresh challenges and disruptions in regard to food, uh, energy, and uh, fertilizer security. This is, in fact, compounding the problems uh, of nations at a time when we are looking to achieve uh, a, a rapid economic recovery from the ravages of the pandemic. As India takes on the presidency of the G20, uh, we should all pin our hopes uh, on working together to address these challenges. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has stated on several occasions that our presidency will uh, definitely redefine this very notion of working together. And our effort will be based on our age-old uh, ethos of uh, considering the entire world a common family. In Sanskrit, we say Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Um, and we are committed to, therefore, uh, striving for the benefit uh, of the Global South. Um, this is, uh, uh, Your Excellency, not an era of war, as uh, the Prime Minister of India has said on uh, recent occasions. And so, therefore, I think this your visit here is uh, a very, very important opportunity for all of us to, uh, as global citizens, to recommit ourselves uh, to strengthening diplomacy and to resolving disputes uh, and differences through peaceful negotiations. That's the only way forward. In my personal capacity as the uh, Think 20 Chair for India uh, during our G20 presidency, for that has fallen to my lot recently, I do hope that we will have a chance to work together with uh, various entities, academicians, and others from the Arab world, including your country. With these uh, brief words, I now call upon uh, His Excellency Dr. Faisal Megdad to deliver his talk on developments in Syria and the region, and of course, our uh, bilateral relations. And after you finish your talk, I will open up uh, uh, the floor to uh, questions. Uh, and request you to respond them uh, as uh, well as you would wish to. Uh, thank you very much, and may I invite you to uh, share your thoughts with us. <clears throat> Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much. Uh, this is an auspicious occasion for me uh, to be with you. It's a great honor. and. Uh, I'm happy that <clears throat> this visit to India came at this time. This, this is a very beautiful time in India. Uh, in Syria, we have uh, started the uh, uh, winter season. It was a little bit cold. Here it is perfect for us. Uh, but this is not what I wanted to say. Uh, what I wanted to say is that with all the talk about uh, good weather, uh, the situation in Syria is uh, improving. And uh, the uh, developments have seen uh, a resounding uh, victory, not only for Syria against terrorism, but uh, for all humanity. Uh, I uh, do believe that uh, once uh, these destructive forces succeeded, then all of us will be suffering in Asia and Africa and Latin America, among Arab countries, uh, because uh, uh, the so-called uh, Arab Spring uh, was ex expected uh, 
to come out with results. Uh, these results are exactly what the Muslim Brotherhood uh, have been <clears throat> planning together with some Western countries for a long time. Uh, some may think this is very strange uh, because the propaganda, uh, international media, have been propagating this springs as, as if they uh, are the solution for the many problems uh, our world is witnessing. But uh, it was really the opposite. Uh, not only that, uh, one of the foreign ministers of the United States uh, openly said, you can go back to the uh, uh, internet, find out what she said. She said, but these people we were sponsoring, we were supporting, we were helping uh, uh, to get rid of the so-called despotic regimes in the Arab area. In fact, this was not the case. They wanted to change uh, and to affect a geopolitical situation. You know, the struggles in the Middle East are uh, there. They have been always there. And the Western powers found only this part of, uh, I mean, some forces to affect the overall situation. In fact, they started with many countries in the region, uh, started in Iraq, moved into Egypt at some point, uh, then to Libya, then to uh, uh, Tunisia, uh, to Yemen, uh, everywhere in the region. Uh, I worked, Mr. Ambassador, for my country at the United Nations for 11 years. And uh, the struggle between us uh, as Arab countries and others was that <clears throat> they were always speaking about the need to change in Arab countries. They said, look, we defeated the Soviet Union. We uh, have, uh, uh, I mean, the absolute power to affect any change. And you Arabs are not changing. Okay, we told them, in which terms do you want us to change? They said, you have to change your position on Israel, you have to change your position on, I mean, Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. Uh, you have to forget about the rights of the Palestinian people. Uh, the, the Israel is there, you have to respect its uh, uh, presence, and you have to recognize that uh, this is uh, the way we want you to follow. Otherwise, you will see what will happen. I was part of this discussion in different United Nations fora and committees officially. I'm not speaking hypothetically or what they believe or what they think. This was directly put before all of us. Uh, but of course, you know, I mean, uh, diplomats usually keep the talk uh, inside the closed doors or write reports to their own governments of what happens. And this is exactly what was uh, at some point. And then they felt that the change should come. <clears throat> but I think they have chosen the wrong horse. Uh, they have not chosen a power that will change the situation in the region into a better situation. And this was deliberately done because they know that once they change the situation in the center of the world, which is Arab countries, then they can go beyond, either threatening different stable political systems, or they can tell them, look, once you don't obey our instructions, you will be in danger. Of course, uh, they have to start the process one way or another. I don't want to speak about concrete countries before our eyes nowadays <clears throat> where the same pattern of behavior was followed. What I mean by that? I mean, they push a group of people, 10, 15, who are not aware of what's happening. And that's exactly what happened in Syria, in Egypt, in 
the Islamic Republic of Iran nowadays, among others. Oh, okay, you demand your de so-called democratic rights and the situation will be changing. They were thinking the situation in Syria will change in five days, six days, seven days, one month, beginning of the year, in Eid al-Adha, Eid al-Fatr. And they were trying all these ways and means of misleading the people. But finally, I mean, the people have to understand that what happened in some Arab countries should not be repeated. Finally, <clears throat> the same powers have to go to Libya and invade Libya. Of course, now with uh, my Egyptian brothers here, they know exactly what happened in Egypt. But the heroic Egyptian army and people uh, were uh, responding to these challenges and told them, no, you cannot succeed which have kept the stability of the country and the uh, achievements of the Egyptian uh, people. But the situation in Libya now, I mean, who knows how it will evolve? Nobody knows. Uh, because, uh, uh, okay, they said uh, Gaddafi is so and so and so, you know, all the description and finally uh, they are there, but they cannot uh, uh, deliver. It is not a battle for democracy. It's absolutely not a battle for freedom and liberty, but it is for their own needs. The uh, petrodollar issue is, uh, uh, is there in the content of the attack against Libya. In Tunisia, you know, the situation has not stabilized until now. Of course, we wish all these Arab countries will get more stability and go back I mean, to a situation which helps the people. <clears throat> and if there is a need for people, then the people can make the change, but not to bring somebody from outside and tell them to affect the change. This is absolutely out of question. Uh, particularly if these terrorist gangs were exported from faraway places. All the terrorists were ally, uh, allowed the freedom of movement. In the case of Syria, at least, uh, the accounts given by Western powers to those who participated in the uh, war against Syria have surpassed the number of 400,000 people coming from neighboring countries, particularly from our northern uh, neighbor, Turkey. Uh, and now everybody is uh, suffering. These people were blind. Uh, they have destroyed everything they could destroy. For example, if you look at pictures that came from Iraq after the uh, Daesh control of ser certain parts of Iraq, there are monuments, historical monuments that go 2,000, 3,000 years, which were demolished by Daesh. And the American interest there was only in the Central Bank and the Ministry of Defense, which they protected very well, I mean, so that nobody could touch these two uh, places. The same happened in Syria. We have a long history. Wherever you step in Syria, you find something related to history. And these are very dear historical monuments uh, that uh, were also uh, uh, de demolished. Uh, by these fanatics. For example, they speak about Palmyra in Syria. All of you are aware what's Palmyra. Uh, uh, it was, I mean, uh, built uh, even before Islam came to Syria. But under the slogan that these are against Islam, they have plundered 
the places and they destroyed the heritage, not of Syria. This is a, a humanitarian, this is a human heritage. It is not only for, for Syria. This was re registered on the uh, uh, UNESCO records as a uh, world heritage, not to speak about other places. And when Prophet Muhammad, alayhi uh, salat, uh, came to Syria, these places were there. I mean, if they were against Islam, he would have ordered uh, their demolition. But uh, he was always uh, uh, appreciating uh, the contribution of civilizations uh, for the building of humanity and the humanity, human principles. Unfortunately, uh, Western propaganda was dominating, particularly their misleading uh, uh, tactics uh, against the leadership, against accusing us of everything, of killing our own people, uh, and of uh, not respecting the so-called uh, principles of human rights, as if they have so much respect for human rights which was always since the beginning of the Cold War era after the Second World War, uh, an issue of propaganda. Of course, uh, we have to respect uh, the contribution of uh, the United States or the uh, Europe uh, and their uh, work in this field. But when they politicized uh, these principles, they have employed them to serve their own interests and this is the reality we have not discovered we were not the only country that discovered these contradictions because to kill innocent people on the one hand by these terrorists and then to say there is a violation of human rights who is violating the human rights of others killing other people who are accused of violating the human rights of uh, I mean, respective countries this is absolutely no way. But what reaches the international community is the Western propaganda. Nobody will listen to our own media. No, on the contrary. The first thing they did in different cases was not to give access to respective countries to uh, international media. The first thing they did in the Syrian case was to block any Syrian possibility to use international communications, exactly the same way they have used with the Russian Federation. The, I mean, we were really shocked when we heard that uh, RT, I mean, the uh, uh, Russian system of communication, I'm not judging their, uh, I mean, uh, freedom to, uh, uh, respond to the challenges the country is facing. But the Western countries have been always trying to convince all of us that the freedom of media and the freedom to think are holy things for them. The first thing they did in Syria was to block any access of the Syrian media, even to our own people in different parts of Syria, and to uh, uh, propagate only one way of media, which is their own media. I don't know whether this is freedom of thinking or freedom of media. It is the opposite. Since 2013, we have been struggling uh, against the accusations made by the Western powers on the use or the uh, pretext that Syria has used chemical weapons against its own people. This is funny. I was there. The place which they claim was bombarded by chemical weapons uh, was not far from Damascus, which means if chemical weapons were used in Syria, they will affect the Syrians. I mean, the gov including the government because it was only 10 kilometers or less than that. Until today, the issue before the uh, uh, 
International Organization on the Prevention of Chemical Weapons is still there. And each day the, mount, the, the campaign against Syria is mounting. Of course, I have to thank all our uh, friends, representatives of the countries who have uh, said this is uh, merely false uh, propaganda. But uh, resolutions are being made, adopted, even uh, the Russian Federation did not get, I mean, more than uh, sometimes three, four votes uh, conducted in the General Assembly or even in the Security Council. You can imagine to which extent the pressure by Western countries, including some of our friends, where ambassadors of the United States and their representatives go to each embassy to tell them you cannot vote against this draft resolution. And finally, we get what we uh, see uh, that may lead at some point to the disintegration of the international political system. That's why many countries are calling for a new international order, an order that will make the sovereignty of states the main principle that needs to be respected. Of course, uh, I mean, if somebody dares uh, vote against uh, resolutions presented by the European Union or by the United States, then uh, you are a traitor. Not only to your country, but a traitor on the international level. We have uh, to uh, establish an order that will respect every country and every people. Uh, we have been fighting now uh, Daesh and its terrorist gr uh, groups, Jabhat al-Nusra, the Muslim Brotherhood, for the last 12 years. Of course, now uh, almost all Syrian territories are liberated. We have a Turkish uh, presence in the north uh, east, uh, west, uh, supporting only in the city of Idlib, uh, Daesh, and the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. The secular nature of Turkey, of course, is behind all of us now. Nobody speaks about that. And uh, uh, Turkey is occupying our territories under the uh, disguise of uh, protecting its own security. Uh, the thousands of terrorists who have come to Syria through Turkey facilitated by Turkey, sent by Western countries and their allies, have devastated the country, as I have said. And uh, uh, hundreds of people, if not thousands, were killed, uh, defending their uh, country, defending themselves. I don't want to share Daesh what they believe. I don't want to believe that the Muslim Brotherhood are representing me because uh, Islam is not uh, that religion that uh, calls for killing others. Never. Uh, all the religions, the main religions, whether Islam or Christianity or Judaism, came in that part of the country. We are living together. All of them. Still, we are still living until today. But then those who contradicted, uh, whose ideas contradicted with the uh, message of Daesh were killed on the spot. Imagine two leaders of Daesh, I mean the top uh, leaders, were killed in the north of Syria, in the land occupied by the Turkish army. Imagine these two leaders were killed inside territories uh, under the control of the Syrian army. But nobody spoke about, spoke about it. Nobody mentioned anything as if this is a natural development. Uh, but when they killed bin Laden in Afghanistan, they have to throw his body, I mean, in the ocean so that nobody can remember him. But why these two I mean, leaders who led Daesh after the killing of bin Laden were not dealt with the same way because they were in Turkey. 
because those who have to be blamed for harboring them is the Turkish government. But the Turkish government is a NATO member and they don't want, I mean, they want them to be active when their end comes, they end them and then they forget that they were supported by, uh, the, by, by these Western countries themselves. And this is the reality of what happened in Syria. Uh, now, Turkey is saying, we harbor some thing like 1 million people as refugees in Turkey. Yes. The camps were built even before the attacks against the Syrian government started. As I said at the beginning, they were thinking it is a matter of five days. They can harbor them and then they will return back. But when Syria withstood all these attacks, and instead of having them for five, six days, one month, one year, then two years, three years, four years, five, 12 years of combating these elements, then uh, they are now saying we have hosted millions of Syrians and uh, the international community should be helping us. But why did you start the whole war against a sovereign country, against a neighboring country? Before that, we were trying to build the best of relations with our northern, uh, I mean, neighbor. But finally, because the Muslim brother ideology is there, then they have to push for the Muslim Brotherhood and Daesh, because Daesh is an offshoot, a more extremist offshoot of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And this is the reality of what's happening. Of course, they wanted to uh, launch uh, attacks against, I mean, using Islam as a banner for more trouble in all countries of the world. But finally, we see uh, a lot of uh, countries uh, defending themselves uh, because we succeeded in Syria. If we did not stop them in Syria, they would come everywhere. No country can spare itself from the menace of uh, these uh, terrorist uh, agents. And of course, in the Northeast, we have uh, American occupation, uh, support for uh, separatist groups that have found, uh, I mean, an atmosphere, an environment to divide the unity of Syria. We have been living together for ages, for centuries. Nowadays only, I mean, these groups come and say we want to secede from Syria. These so-called, I mean, we, 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 call, we call them Kurdish, I mean, elements. Of course, I mean, we in Syria do not recognize, I mean, the ethnic background of our citizens. All of them are equal before the before the law and are together <clears throat> and we are fighting together with our uh, in different communities against Muslim Brotherhood and Daesh. But then the United States have to establish herself in the Northeast and to support the separatist group. We have to be aware that they are supporting also other separat separatist groups in different parts of the world just to weaken the government. But I go back to the stupidity of the Turkish government because they have the same danger of separatist forces. As I said, they were thinking the battle will continue for five, six days because in Turkey, there are more than 15 million Kurds. And they claim that they are afraid of a similar separatist movement. Somebody may ask me then, why did they uh, support this Muslim Brotherhood in Syria and others? <clears throat> My answer would be is that they were stupid because when they did not think that weakening Syria and its army will help these separatist forces and then the repercussions will be in Turkey herself, then I don't know how some politicians would not use 
neither wisdom nor political analysis of defining their priorities. Because when they support any disturbances in Syria, then they have to think that these will go there, including the extremist forces or uh, groups uh, that uh, they depended on making or affecting a regime change in Syria. They did not succeed. And of course, uh, some people may say the Syrian government used uh, its, uh, uh, I mean, forces uh, excessively uh, against so-called peaceful demonstrators and so on, which is absolutely out of question because the government will not use excessive force against its own people. And if the over majority of Syrians did not support their government, then they, their government will not be in a position to be there for 12 years fighting day and night. And this battle was not for the Syrian army, but it was for each individual. I, I mean, I remember uh, sometime when the ministry I work for, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I was uh, the vice minister of foreign affairs, when even the rockets were falling on our ministry, uh, trying to destroy it and to destroy us. But we did not care because the homeland is the only thing that uh, we need uh, to uh, harbor in our hearts so that uh, we have a homeland to live in. Because people who, who forget about their homeland, then they forget their honor and they forget, I'm not accusing everybody, of course, but, uh, and dignity. Okay, you can live for the United States or for Europe for economic reasons, but finally you have to go back for a homeland. Without a homeland, people will not have uh, to think that others will respect them. You can stay wherever you like, but you have to have a homeland. Even in all religions, the homeland is a sacred thing for humanity, and we have to respect that. Uh, I spoke about uh, the uh, repercussions of different attacks uh, and different conspiracies. Uh, uh, recently, uh, Resolution uh, 2642 was adopted in the Security Council. Uh, it calls for early recovery in Syria, for supporting, I mean, the destruction of the infrastructure and so on. Imagine, uh, today I was discussing with our Indian friends their support for Syria. Uh, we were having 24 hours electricity per day in 2010 until 2012. Uh, even in the desert, where Bedouins have their camps, electricity was there. Nowadays, we have it only for two hours in Damascus, then four hours of cutoff, then two hours. Sometimes it doesn't come at all because we don't have oil, we don't have anything. And the oil is being stolen by the American forces in the Northeast because in the Northeast, we have all our will. We have the water there, from the Euphrates to uh, Tigris. We have the oil uh, uh, in that part, and we have uh, the wheat, because this is the most fertile part of Syria. Nowadays, we don't have oil. Uh, our Iranian friends are, I mean, giving us oil. But of course, when you are importing, this will never be uh, sufficient for your needs. And of course, we thank all our friends who are trying to help us. Uh, there is the gas in the Northeast. The Americans are blocking it and they are smuggling it every day. 
70 uh, trucks take the Syrian oil to the north of Iraq and then to Turkey and other countries, selling it uh, for themselves and for encouraging separatist forces in the north east of Syria. When we were able to achieve our uh, successes in the fight against terrorism, uh, then uh, we uh, had to face a different challenge. This time, it is the unilateral coercive measures, uh, or let me call it uh, unilateral sanctions. Now, even if we want to buy medicine, we cannot buy medicine. We come to India uh, because here is a bastion of uh, human feelings and sense. Uh, they don't ap apply these sanctions because India has never believed in sanctions against peoples. In fact, these sanctions are not harming the government of Syria, but they are a tool of pressure on the Syrian people to pressurize their government to leave. And the government is strong. Uh, the people believe in the government. So for the last seven, eight years, of course, Syria has suffered sanctions since 1978, but they were not as harsh as they are today. Uh, it was the, the American policy with Europe. We did not have problem at that time. So. The, the, the American sanctions were not applicable to Syria at that time. Nowadays, uh, Europe have, under the pressure of the United States, uh, joined uh, the United States in imposing these sanctions. We cannot import food. We cannot import wheat because all the wheat in the north of Syria is in the lands occupied by Turkey, by the United States. We cannot import uh, basic needs. Uh, I don't know how we shall cover this winter when it comes to the cold weather, because in some parts of Syria we have snow. In fact, as I said at the beginning, uh, we are uh, now the cold weather have started. Uh, in Syria, we cannot go like this. I mean, we have to uh, have uh, more clothes. I don't know how Syrian children will face another year of sanctions on oil because nobody is giving us oil except what I said about the Iranian uh, help. And uh, uh, the I mean, and they claim they are respecting the human rights. And they say in their statements, uh, Syrian children are suffering, Syrian women disabled are suffering. But these are just mere words to cover up for the real massacres they are committing in Syria. These people are not dying because of bombardment. They are dying because of sanctions. Hundreds of them. We don't have medicine. I mean, in, in Syria, all these public services Education is a free of charge. It has always been the policy. It is given to everybody. The schools were destroyed. Many of the schools, thousands. Now we have more than 5,000 schools which are demolished because they were used by the, uh, by the terrorist groups. And we are calling on the United Nations and other European countries. They say, no, you are under sanctions. And our children, many of them, are finding it difficult to go to schools. In the health sector, we have our public system, which provides health care for everybody uh, at the expense of the government. Now, of course, many of these hospitals were destroyed. I remember once uh, I received the representative of the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights. They were asking us in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to go to a hospital in Aleppo. Frankly speaking, I told them, yes, you can go there. They said, we shall take some uh, humanitarian aid uh, to that hospital. When he came back, 
okay, what did you find? He said, we did not find the hospital because uh, it was used by Daesh. All the equipments, it was the best uh, eye hospital in the, in the Middle East, in Aleppo. And all the uh, instruments were stolen, taken out to Turkey, together with our factories in the northern part of Syria, and given to Turkish companies. He said, I told him, okay, but what did you find there? He said, people with long beards, with children around them, carrying arms that are longer, taller than them, and uh, they are using the hospital as a place for, uh, uh, as a camp for uh, Daesh, and at that time, Jabhat al-Nusra was there, the, the Muslim Brotherhood. This is the reality. So why I am bringing these facts into your uh, consideration, it is because we have to stop these people from winning anywhere. And because the battle against them is a battle for all of us. We don't have to spare any effort in supporting those countries who suffer the menace of terrorism. They are dangerous to humanity. They should never be tolerated. They should never be uh, accepted because they are not the human beings. Nowadays, in a whole camp, which is not under the control of the Syrian government, uh, the American and Kurdish uh, uh, separatist forces have controlled the camp al whole in the east, in the northern east of Syria. Uh, in this camp, there were something like 68,000 people. The majority of them, more than 70% or 80%, according to United Nations figures, are children. And women uh, who were married to uh, these jihadists, as they call them. And we don't know what to do with this because European countries where these terrorists came from, are saying we don't accept it. We don't want these terrorists back to our own countries. In fact, they sent them to fight in Syria, but did not receive them as citizens of the European countries. And we are saying together with the United Nations that <clears throat> those sending countries should receive back their uh, uh, the presents they gave to Syria. Uh, some of them are taking the children. They say, no, we cannot take the women. We can take the children because they are of uh, uh, European origin. Italians, uh, Dutch, uh, French, and so on. Uh, but they don't accept the, uh, the women. Absolutely, they don't accept the men who they want to, them to remain in that uh, camp, which is described by international organizations as inhuman. It is not for people to live there. Even, allow me to use this expression, animals cannot live there. Under the heat in uh, summer and under the uh, cold weather in winter and in camps. But we are telling them, yes, come to us and uh, take your uh, citizens back to your countries. We are helping them to do this. I don't want to take all the time, uh, but uh, I can tell our Indian friends that they faced the menace of terrorism. Uh, we sympathize with the Indian people. Uh, we are ready to work with the Indian people and the government uh, in the field of combating terrorism. There is no precondition for this fight and for cooperation in the elimination of terrorism because uh, many people would feel that, uh, uh, I mean, hes hesitant to cooperate in security terms. But because now we are speaking, I mean, before this distinguished uh, uh, gathering, uh, I'm saying that uh, we are ready to work with the Indian government and with any other government on combating terrorism. 
as I said, terrorism is a danger for humanity. It should never be tolerated. It should never be accepted. And all our institutions, universities, schools, any uh, civil uh, institution should be empowered and enabled to play a leading role in combating terrorism. Terrorism should never be tolerated. This is the lesson we have come out with. And we shall always be ready to work with civilized countries uh, like India, because what joined us, as you mentioned, is this uh, civilization uh, background, this, this legacy of cooperation among civilized people who understand the meaning of life and who understand that all of us were created by God and have to respect the will of God, but not the will of terrorists who kill life and who do not believe in any God because they are against all our uh, traditions, against uh, our uh, life and against any international norms. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm ready to answer all the questions because I would like to listen. Yeah. Here is better. So uh, you will all agree that that was a very thought-provoking address delivered by His Excellency Dr. Faisal Magdad, and I thank you for your remarks. Uh, there were two major takeaways for me, uh, and these were essentially the fact that uh, the world needs uh, to unite in the fight against terrorism. I, I, I'm heard uh, by all of them. any case, so basically saying that the world needs to unite in the fight against terrorism uh, and uh, that it should do so by rising above the divisive politics of today, the divisive ideologies. And you rightly pointed out that India has also long faced the menace of terrorism. In fact, uh, we have faced the menace of terrorism uh, for many decades, long before the rest of the world woke up to the threat of terrorism. We have also suffered the consequences of uh, what you might refer to as uh, state-sponsored terrorism, where states use terrorism as part of their toolkit in order to, uh, you know, uh, create problems in neighboring countries. Uh, so I think what you said hits a chord in this uh, eclectic audience that's made up of uh, strategic experts, diplomats, uh, people from the armed forces. The other key message uh, that you gave us, uh, Foreign Minister, is that uh, the world also needs uh, a very big dose of um, what you might call uh, humanity itself, core values. The world needs a new moral compass uh, to guide it uh, into the future. With these uh, few words, I would like to now uh, invite uh, uh, brief uh, and to the point questions from the audience. I will take three at a time and uh, much will depend on how much time His Excellency is willing to spend with us. Uh, so may I request you to raise your hands for the first round uh, and please introduce yourself and uh, do uh, kindly restrict yourself to a question. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Excellency, for this uh, uh, talk today. I'm Deepika Saraswat, uh, Associate Fellow at the Institute, and I study Iran. So uh, I would like to ask a question about the, the phase of reconstruction uh, that you referred to uh, that has now begun in Syria. And if, uh, I, if I remember correctly, in 2017, after uh, Syria was able to, uh, Syrian security forces captured uh, al Bukamal and the Iraqis, uh, uh, the al Qaim uh, transit, there was talk of this tr uh, trade and transit corridor connecting Iranian ports to Syrian and uh, Lebanese port on the Mediterranean. So I was uh, hoping to get your comments on the feasibility of this uh, massive uh, infrastructure project that has long been in uh, uh, talk, but. Uh... Thank you. Uh, any other question from the floor? Uh, yes, back there, please.
right here. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. Uh, my sh short question is, uh, we saw what happened during the Arab Spring, the spread of radical ideologies. As a long-term solution, what do you think, how does the Syrian government plan to tackle uh, radicalism, not terrorism, but radical ideology spreading in the whole of, uh, in the, whole of the country by uh, the radical ideologies such as Muslim Brotherhood, which are backed by Turkey and Qatar, which are state sponsored at DG Sir's earlier spoke about. Thank you. I think the three questions are really relevant, are direct to the point. On the first question, uh, uh, yes, uh, I mean, countries are working together, cooperating. Uh, uh, I think uh, some countries are. Uh, raising the idea of uh, the Silk Road that will, I mean, cover all of us. Uh, uh, so it is natural to encourage regional cooperation, uh, including this idea of uh, establishing uh, uh, economic ties with our direct neighbors, because we have uh, different interests. But of course, these ideas are not limited uh, to, I mean, three or four countries. They are open for everybody, I mean, because economically speaking, we have to work, all of us. If uh, in India we uh, need medicine, then uh, we have to open the way and to see how uh, to establish certain uh, methods, whether it is uh, this uh, uh, road, I mean, uh, from Iran to uh, Baghdad to Damascus. I don't know the relevance because the presence of American troops in the south of Syria is just to prevent this from taking place. They believe that uh, uh, this direct line will not help Israel. That's why the United States is giving itself the uh, responsibility of protecting Israeli interests, of course. I mean, we shall not use this road for military uh, aspects or mobilization. This is a different story. Uh, but when this kind of road, for example, is established, then Indian goods would go easily to Syria. And instead of waiting to to reach, then uh, in five or four days, uh, Indian shipments to the region will go directly. Now people are thinking of this uh, road from the uh, south of Asia into Russia and to the north of Europe and then to uh, uh, all countries of the European Union. We did not express any uh, hostility to such a building, but we think all efforts by the countries to deepen their bilateral and multilateral cooperation should be open. The United States should not look for its own interests only. It should look for the interests of the peoples. Then uh, what was the second question? Yeah, a local, of course, uh, we are discussing with different countries this possibility, which has become very important and relative after the sanctions used, I mean, recently imposed by the European Union and uh, the United States and Russia. You know, even I think the uh, uh, European Union has sanctioned 
great, big amounts of money in their banks that go back to private uh, companies uh, in the Russian Federation. Uh, so this possibility uh, should be there. I think it will uh, uh, make it easier for exchanges between our developed countries. Uh, all of them uh, have now greater problems, you know, for I don't know how many cents the United States uh, pays for each printing each dollar two three cents, but then it gives us uh, I mean the headache in Syria now uh, before the the war in Syria, the currency rate was forty five to forty eight Syrian pounds against the dollar. Now it is five thousand something. The say in Lebanon it is more than that. It is something like 38,000 Lebanese pounds against each dollar. It was less than three, 4,000 pounds a few years ago. But under the circumstances, the Lebanese people are devastated and the Syrian people are devastated because the, what, what's happening is that the United States is printing paper, giving us, I mean, this paper and taking against it all the uh, natural products uh, at a very cheap price. <laughs> <coughs> so we believe that uh, uh, countries of the world have to be aware of how much money is being taken by the United States by forcing its peoples to uh, establish misleading uh, figures uh, of national, uh, I mean, currency against the dollar. Yes, we are investigating this possibility and we have started uh, taking concrete measures in this uh, regard. Uh, the third question, radicalism. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, what you said is really correct. Uh, what we are doing is exactly what you said. We are trying to educate our people, uh, schools, uh, universities, uh, through public media. That's why we achieved something. <clears throat> because in countries like Syria, Egypt, and so on, the media is oriented against radicalism, is oriented against, I mean, uh, uh, radical uh, Islam or any radical other thing, I mean, radicalism is not limited to Islam. It also, uh, I mean, uh, uh, could be taken by others uh, from all religions. And, uh, uh, but of course, uh, uh, some people are speaking about Islamophobia. We believe that this is wrong and uh, all of us should respect each other, whatever religion whatever ideas, whatever, I mean, concepts that people believe in should be respectful, but not to be put in the hands of radicalism to go and kill others because they believe uh, the other is wrong and we are, I mean, correct. And you can see the effects of such a thing, whether in Europe or in Asia or in the Middle East, or uh, of course, uh, I'm happy that in almost African countries, we don't have the same, but in Latin America, you may have it in political terms, different terms. So we have to <clears throat> employ our efforts to combat radicalism and the media is playing a very important role in this respect. Do I see any more questions from the floor? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Mudassar.
Thank you. Can I answer yes, this of question? Yes, uh, Astana is going to meet again uh, the 21st, 22nd. Uh, the three uh, main countries, namely uh, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, will meet. A Syrian delegation uh, from the government will be there. And uh, other uh, observers are invited, uh, neighboring countries of Syria, namely Jordan, Iraq, and uh, Jordan, Iraq, who, who else? Okay, it, it will come. Uh, so uh, I hope, I mean, the Astana process has, <clears throat> in fact, uh, moved the uh, negotiations uh, in a good direction. We are committed to respecting the results of all these meetings. And uh, we hope the forthcoming meeting, of course, I know uh, what are the drafts, be, uh, which are going to be presented to the next meeting. But one of them is dealing with the uh, kidnapped people, with the uh, missing people. And I hope some good news will come about that. Because we, on the part of the Syrian government, are ready to work together with these countries to see uh, how uh, an inter-Syrian process will result at the end of the exercise, of a political exercise, to find uh, a solution that will satisfy the needs of the Syrian people. A process which will be among the Syrians, for the Syrians, by the Syrians, without any international or foreign interference. I think we have completely run out of time, I'm afraid, and uh, His Excellency has other engagements as well. Uh, so uh, with this, I will bring to a close uh, this uh, wonderful session which has uh, seen Dr. Faisal Magdath, His Excellency, Foreign Minister of Syria, address us. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, and we will, I think, uh, request the MC to come back on. And may I request you, sir, to kindly take your seat. I request the Director General, Ambassador Chinoy, to present MPIDSC publications and memento to His Excellency Dr. Faisal Mekhtar as a token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Please, uh, there's a vote of thanks, I think. So. Oh. May I now request the Deputy Director General MPIDSA, Major General Dr. Bipin Bakshi, yeah. to deliver the vote of thanks, please. Thank you. Very good afternoon, all. I'm sure I speak for all the participants that we have all benefited very greatly from this purposeful discussion on some of the critical issues which are affecting not only Syria, the Middle East region, but which have implication for the whole world. We too share the concerns, sir, over terrorism and proxy war by transnational organizations. Very recently, just about three weeks back, 29th October, we had the Delhi Declaration, which is a non-binding document under the aegis of the United Nations Security Council Counterterrorism Committee. All the members were here. And we have uh, issued this document, which is called the Delhi Declaration on New Age Terrorism. On behalf of Team MPIDSA, sir, and ladies, it is my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this important occasion. At the outset, I'd like to express my profound gratitude to His Excellency, Dr. Faisal Magdad, for his insightful talk, for sparing time from his busy schedule to be with us, and for his very frank answers during the question and answer session. I would also like to thank Ambassador Sujan R. Chinoy, our DG MPIDSA, for conceiving this event, for guiding us in the preparations, and for moderating this session. We thank the diplomats and officials from the various embassies, uh, the heads and the members from other think tanks who are here with us uh, and have uh, been able to spare the time to join us. I'm also grateful to the Syrian Embassy 
the their officials, the West Asia North Africa Division of MEA, and our own West Asia Center of MPIDSA for coordinating this event. I thank the conference cell and our technical team for setting up and running this event. Lastly, but not the least, I will thank all the participants and the scholars and the media persons who are here with us, whether physically or remotely. Thank you very much. Good day. ये वो आ रहा है, रेटली आ रहा है सर